Today's Thursday gathering is focused on MedTech innovation. Uh, we are always excited to host um, every month the MedTech Innovation Forum that we do in partnership with Zymedica and Nemec. And it is now officially part of our um, second Thursday, Venture Cafe Thursday gathering uh, from 12 to one every month. Since 2014, as I mentioned, and I know some new people popped in, so I'll repeat this. Um, since 2014, Zymedica has conducted this forum as an internal monthly information sharing platform to inform its employees about the newest medical related technologies in the public domain with the intent to spur creative ideas and innovative thinking into their work. Through our partnership, we are excited to bring this monthly forum to spur innovative ideas in all of you. Uh, District Hall Providence opened in 2019. Um, that's behind me is our event space. Um, to support startups, innovators, and small businesses by providing them with free and open workspace. And then we have meeting rooms and event space. We uh, love to engage entrepreneurs and innovators in our free programming that supports entrepreneurship and innovation, including this signature Venture Cafe Thursday gathering, as well as many non-Thursday programs. We've pivoted to provide our community with virtual programming throughout the week, including this partnership with Zymedica and Nemec, and we welcome you to this event. Before um, we get started, I'll introduce you to our partners. Uh, Danielle, you just heard a little bit from, um, but why don't you take it from here, Danielle? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Danielle Sturm, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager at the New England Medical Innovation Center, otherwise known as NEMIC. And we are a medtech venture studio located in Providence, Rhode Island, and we support medtech startups from all over the world, develop their businesses in the U.S., prepare for fundraising, and bring their medtech ideas forward to successful commercialization. Um, we are a nonprofit, so a lot of our programming is free to startups, um, but we find ways to work with anyone. So if you are a medtech entrepreneur looking for any type of support or connections to fundraising, please reach out to me. Um, a little bit earlier, I announced that we are hosting two hackathons, um, a COVID-19 response innovation hackathon. Um, I dropped a link to the chat in the chat to the webpage for that hackathon, so you can go explore it there. Um, but we are looking to create new systems, services, technologies that will help our healthcare system in Rhode Island best prepare um, for the next pandemic, for this pandemic, or any type of healthcare-related crisis in the future. Um, one more announcement I have is last week we announced our partnership with the new Magpie X MedTech Accelerator Fund. Um, and directly after this forum at one o'clock, we will be having a 30 minute informational session with the leadership team of Magpie X, um, where you can learn more about the accelerator program, the in-cash and in-kind investment that comes with it, um, and what types of MedTech and digital health startups we are looking to apply. And this is really exciting because um, this type of fund is the first in Rhode Island and one of the only kinds of its type um, in New England. And we were really excited to be able to offer a cash investment along with the NEMIC programming to startups from all over the world. Um, I'll drop the links to both these in the chat. Um, but before we get started with the forum, I'll turn over to Mark Cole of Zymedica. Thanks very much, Danielle and Tuni. Um, <clears throat> just a, a quick word because we obviously want to get on with uh, and, and hear Jessica today. Um, but um, this is one of several forums that we conduct. Uh, the, our product uh, design team and also product development teams do a very similar thing. And the goal of these uh, sessions, and we do them internally, and now we're actually starting to open them up to everybody to see, is really to spark innovation. And you'll see a lot of very cool things today, a lot of very interesting things, but it's very current. Um, and it's very, very much, um, you know, sort of geared towards what we do, which is help people commercialize uh, ideas and concepts. It can be something that's in their head or on a piece of paper, but what we specialize in and what we lead the market in is to take those concepts, to take that innovation all the way through to commercialization. And we've actually uh, positioned ourselves in a way to do just that. So this is really one of those uh, forums where it really gets the creative juices stirred. And, and what it results in is it just brings a lot of additional value to our clients who partner with us and trust us to really know what we're doing. And uh, I thank Jessica for today. Um, no doubt it's going to be another humdinger, and I always look, look, looked forward to these ones. Uh, but please don't tell that to the design team and the development teams because uh, they won't invite me anymore. So over to you, Jessica. Great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for those introductions. 
Okay, so for those who are new um, or coming in after uh, a uh, sabbatical, um, we cover, uh, we, we watch and follow uh, a number of different categories in the, in the context of medtech innovation, which is summarized here. Um, this has been a kind of evolving and expanding list. Obviously, COVID-19 is one of the ones that's been included in the past year. We've also added imaging because um, there's an, an awful lot of new technologies in that, uh, in that realm as well. So I'm going to jump right in in terms of materials. Um, this is a device that pulls water out of air um, and it's drinkable. Um, it's coming out of a, an academic team at National University of Singapore, obviously in that country. Um, and how it works is it has, there's a sponge-like aerogel that is doing the conversion um, of uh, ta tapping water vapor in air and turning it into drinkable water um, without there being a power source or moving part. So this could be really quite magical for um, kind of very uh, dry or, or even more humid areas where there is little, little safe drinking water. Um, the material has a long polymers that are within a metal organic porous framework and that, has a, that creates a high surface area in, in, the, in that porous uh, porous membrane. And the right combination of a kind of chemical structure is essentially attracts and both repels that water so it can be collected um, and then condensed and then released. Um, so there's a kind of a, a pretty magical kind of a sponge-like a sponge uh, solution without there needing to be a squeezing mechanism. When this contraption is exposed to sunlight, its actual efficacy is actually really quite impressive of a 90% water conversion rate. Um, so one kilograms of material is actually quite a significant amount, can produce 4.5 gallons of water per day. When you think about um, some of the more developing countries where um, there are folks um, who their daily life spend, you know, is in, involving, you know, fetching water um, and uh, filtering it so that it can be drinkable to be able to cook with and to be able to share with their families, it, it could be a real game changer. But the next material is very in a very different realm. Um, it's been uh, given its, uh, the name Faraday, Faraday Fabrics um, from an academic team at Drexel. Um, it is, what it does is it blocks or pro uh, protects a device uh, from any electromagnetic waves. Um, and it's a, a basic material um, using a basic conductive material called something mech, called mechzine. Um, so, you know, in our universe today, there are a, an incredible number of devices that are emitting electromagnetic waves. You think of radios, TVs, of course, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and all those cell networks that we're carrying around in our, in our pockets. And all of those can interfere with each other, disrupting and slowing connections as we all start to uh, become much more sophisticated in our uh, devices that we're using. Um, and so, Today, how uh, those devices are trying to function um, to protect themselves from other, dis uh, other disrupting electromagnetic waves is the materials inside these devices are covered with a copper foil. That adds bulk and of course that adds cost because copper ain't cheap. Um, and so this Mexi material is actually really pretty incredible because it can be sprayed. It can be a conductive clay and it can enable faster charging of battery electrodes. Um, and just in the material. So even taking a cotton or linen material and dipping it into this mexine solution can result in uh, almost 100% blocking of those electromagnetic wave signals. Um, and because the material uh, has, it, it, it can have a flaking uh, format, it can stick really well to the fabric fibers um, of cotton or linen as an example. So this could dramatically reduce some of the costs of, uh, of, uh, of devices and they can also get smaller. Um, this product um, is kind of looking for a reason to be, in my opinion, it's a sweat evaporation and energy harvesting film. Also coming from University of Singapore, they've been busy, obviously. Um, so what this film does is it speeds up the process of evaporating sweat uh, to remove heat. So obviously uh, in the visual that we have here, it could be pretty useful for sneakers, um, for those people who have very sweaty feet. Um, it, it's made with two water absorbers, uh, something called cobalt chlorine and uh, ethanol, ethylo, ethylamine, one of my favorite parts of this tech forum is pronouncing those very unpronounceable names, 
Um, and this is uh, set into a, a breathable, here we go, polytetrafluoroethylene membrane. Um, and so the materials can be incorporated into a shoe sole, as you can see here, or underarm pads to keep people more dry and more comfortable. Of course, there are other products that can serve the same purpose, like talcum powder or deodorant. Um, so again, not quite sure what the real value of this product is going to be. But the film does change color as it absorbs moisture. You, know, you want to take off, take off your shoes to see how much sweat you've absorbed in your shoe. Um, and uh, it can release the trapped water when placed in sunlight. So it's a reusable device uh, over time. Um, the potentially very positive thing about this, it could start to become an energy harvester because uh, of electrolytes that can be sandwiched between those electrochemical cells. Um, so potentially we could actually be starting to um, have wearable uh, electronics that are powered by the sweat that we create as we are exercising and getting sweaty. This next material um, takes a lot electronics and specifically electronic displays and tries to think about how to make them biodegradable. Um, this comes from an academic team in Germany. Um, and the device itself is using an organic polymer called PE dot, PE dot colon PSS. I don't know what that, uh, that acronym stands for. Um, and it changes the light absorption as uh, voltage is applied. And um, as you can see on the image here, the display can move between both a clear state and an opaque state. Um, the po polymer is placed, as you can see, on the kind of gel-like uh, substrate uh, that has both a cellulose diacetate as well as an electrolyte gelatin. Um, and the good things about those two um, uh, materials is that they're both flexible and they're adhesive, which is great for applying to skin um, or more contoured surfaces. The electrical current is generated by gold electrodes and the display can be produced with an inkjet printer. Um, and so obviously this could be used as a skin sensor, um, particularly for more temporary monitoring of a patient condition. For example, think about a, um, a, 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 a heart monitor that you want a patient to wear for three or four days to be able to really properly diagnose a heart condition. Or it could be used as food packaging to understand whether food is spoiled in transit, uh, transit or before it's eaten. But the fact that we're now trying to think about electronics that are uh, expanding into um, kind of more environmentally friendly uh, capabilities is pretty interesting. All right, this next material is also a diagnostic um, and it's exploring the idea of using fluorescence um, to provide much higher sensitivity uh, for a microneedle patch. We've talked about a lot of the microneedle patches in the, far, uh, in the past and they're really great for um, very painlessly applying um, to the skin to deliver a drug or even uh, monitor for interstitial interstitial <laughs> fluids uh, right under the skin. Um, there have been several innovations in the past that have explored looking at uh, this, these types of patches, for example, for monitoring glucose levels for diabetics, as an example, and delivering various different drugs. But the problem is, is that the biomarkers in interstitial fluid are much, much harder to detect than if you were to take um, a blood sample. So this team from Washington University in, in St. Louis have um, explored using uh, what they call an ultra bright, ultra bright fluorescent tag, um, which, may, which is made from plasmonic fluor. Um, and that uh, fluorescence is glowing at uh, 1,400 times brighter in response to specific biomarkers that can really boost the sensitivity of, of one of these micro, micro patches. So they did a, a mice study um, that looked for the detection of an antibody protein called paris periostin um, and found that they had an 800 times higher sensitivity than the standard patch. So um, some of the use scenarios could be that they were exploring for uh, what this could mean in the real world beyond mice and their proteins is you know, thinking about an e EMT uh, uh, picking up a patient who seems to have some cardiac problems and getting them to the emergency room, they could stick a microneedle patch on this patient to evaluate for troponin, which is a um, assessment of uh, myocardial infarction and know the results really quickly before they even arrive at the, um, at the emergency care um, uh, entrance. And so they can uh, basically speed up the process of diagnosis and help that patient faster. All right, another material, which is also a sensor and a diagnostic and also in the realm of digital health is a 
a bandage that can predict the uh, oncoming of a pressor ul pressure ulcer. So it's a, there's a smart wound bandage um, that's you know, flexible enough um, and it's also disposable enough that it can uh, live as a wound dressing um, and it has an inkjet printed oxygen sensitive patch um, as part of, the, uh, as part of the dressing. And so when that is applied to the body, um, it's able, because of the oxygen sensi sensitivity, it's able to detect if blood circulation is becoming more restricted, less oxygen, um, which is one of the primary causes of a pressure, pressure ulcer. So if you apply this to an area of the body, for example, a, pa a, a bedridden patient who is, um, has their heels or their ankles pressing against uh, pressing against the mattress for long periods of time, you may want to put a bandage on there to be able to detect if a pressure ulcer is potentially going to form and therefore uh, rotate that patient more often. There's an app that accompanies this that is able to objectively analyze the luminescent intensity. Um, and if, if deemed dangerously low, the app then can alert the clinical team to take more pre preventative measures. And they believe that they can make this uh, product um, for uh, a cost of goods of a dollar or less. So um, the, the uh, application could be quite meaningful um, in terms of care, caring for pressure ulcers, which is something that hospitals do really care about because if they do um, have a patient develop an alt pressure ulcer, they have to pay for it out of their own pockets. So this could be very meaningful for um, a lot of uh, folks in the medical healthcare field. All right, moving more firmly into sensor devices, uh, this is an interesting product. It's uh, called the Sunrise Sensor by a company of the same name, and it is intended to diagnose for sleep apnea. Um, right now, how one gets diagnosed for sleep ap apnea is a pain in the butt. It takes a quite a while. You have to visit a sleep cl clinic to have a polysomnography, essentially you're sleeping whilst they're watching you uh, with all kinds of uh, tests and these put onto your, put onto your body. Um, and then it requires special, specialized staff to really properly interpret the, the, uh, the results that come from that uh, sleep clinic. Um, in some countries like France in particular, the wait time for one of these appointments can be months. So you might um, take, uh, it might be quite a long time until you actually uh, get the care that you need. So this device speeds all that up because you can do it at home. Um, this is a small three milligram weight um, device that's attached, as you can see on the image here, to the chin before sleep. And what the sensor is doing is it's recording jaw movements as well as upper airway muscle contractions that are uh, key indicators for sleep apnea. Um, the patient guides, uh, sorry, the app guides the patient through the process of applying it correctly and then delivers the results on waking and you can, just, and you can do the test over multiple nights so it's not just one night that is uh, the, the, uh, the one that's assessed. And all that data can be shared with a clinician at your, at your choice. Um, and uh, you can also uh, understand the trends in the analysis behind it. And it's really quite reasonable uh, for 66 bucks, commercially available today. Right, the next sensor device is a wearable biosensing hand gesture recognition system uh, coming from UC Berkeley. This is a computer chip that's in, it, it enabled with a thin film armband that's worn on the forearm. And uh, as uh, an individual performs different hand gestures, their electrical sensors in the band that detect the nerve signals um, at 64 locations in the arm. Um, there's an AI algorithm that has, uh, is able to detect different signal patterns to identify specific gestures. So if I hold my thumb up, it can tell that I'm holding my thumb up and not my other, one of my other fingers, right? So the system is able to right now currently recognize a whole bunch of different gestures um, and including uh, it, down to the individual finger level. Um, data processing is happening directly on the chip, so there's no sending the information to the cloud, which some folks might be more concerned about in terms of their own privacy. And so you can see this being really quite meaningful for virtual reality, gesture control, thinking about um, in the medical device space, um, you know, how, a, how a clinician might be able to um, have more fine motor control with surgical tools. Um, and it can also have a, a lot of relevance for prosthetics, um, particularly in the hands as well as also obviously for video games, <laughs> what we all care about. Okay, so the next sensor device um, is for the boaters out there, and I know in Rhode Island there's quite a few. This is called the First Mate Marine Safety and Security System by Mercury Marine. This is for a thousand, just under a thousand bucks. This is a system that enables the captain or any other of the passengers on the boat to know if somebody's gone overboard. 
It's a, uh, a combination of wristband fobs that are worn both by the boat captain and up to seven passengers. And there's also a central hub that is connected to the boat's motor propulsion system. And there's also a mobile app. So if one of the folks goes overboard, um, the FOB sets out, sends out a distress signal uh, when it's uh, touched water. And that alert sounds at the hub, as well as all the other six, seven passengers on board. Now, if the captain falls overboard, it's not game over. This whole, uh, the, the, the system is, is designed so it can shut off the boat engine. And then the instructions can be sent to the other team members via the app that they have or other passengers on the boat to how to restart the engine and navigate back to where the captain is to pull him out of the water. Um, it's quite a, quite a, uh, I haven't seen it work. I haven't seen it in practice. I don't think there's any videos yet, but maybe um, if, uh, as a, as a, if so, if a boat does end up buying this, I'm very curious to know what they think. All right, another sensor device. This is uh, for the bees. <laughs> uh, bees are having a lot of a uh, lot of issues at the moment, um, and the Apis Protect um, is a product, a sensor-based uh, product that's coming out of Ireland. So, if you're a beekeeper and you have a number of different hives, uh, you will know that um, you have to inspect those hives regularly um, in order to make sure that your bees are still healthy and they're not dying off. But it's a time-consuming process. Um, not only is it stressful for the beekeeper to be around all those bees, but it's also apparently stressful for the bees to have their hive disrupted. So this automates the process. Um, there's two elements to the system. There's a, a battery powered sensor that's installed underneath uh, the hive roof, and there's a centrally located base station. Um, the sensors are continuously monitoring a, a number of different biomarkers of the hive, temperature, humidity, bee movement, and bee sound levels. And all of that data is sent to a base station that then transmits, transit, transmit it, transmits it to a cloud-based server. And then there's an online dashboard where the beekeeper can check on his hive data without actually having to visit his hives, assuming that they are spread across uh, various different uh, places uh, in his local area. If the system determines the presence of a disease or pest infestation based on changes in uh, what would be considered baseline, the beekeeper gets that alert and can go um, and examine that hive and, and, and ideally treat it. This is commercially available today. Staying on the realm of hives and bees, um, the hive controller um, is a device that is designed to robotically lift and collect honeycombs out of beehives. Apparently this is a pretty difficult thing to do. Um, these things are heavy, particularly when they're loaded with honey. Um, and it, so it's, it's physically difficult. Um, when this robotic system is placed on top of a high, hive, a push button initiates a, a set of steps that essentially lower hooks into the hive and bring up each honeycomb and then hang it in a sequence on a set of racks built into the, into the architecture of it. Um, as the honeycomb is pulled out, uh, brushes run along the side of each one, brushing off the bees without harming them. And then once all the honeycombs are out, uh, the beekeeper gets notified through an audio alert, and then uh, those honeycombs, honeycombs can be removed to extract honey. Um, and, that, uh, and all of that process, is, takes, it takes half the time compared to human labor. Um, but at $3,000 a pop, I wonder whether that is actually a business proposition that, uh, that uh, makes sense uh, financially. But they did win an award uh, from CES uh, this past January, and they are trying to fund uh, their product development through an Indigo Go funding campaign. All right, moving into robotics. Um, Things are getting incredibly small in robotics, and this is just a really perfect example. They're called the Micro Robotic Steerable Laser. Um, coming out of Harvard, uh, this is a technology that enables the accurate steering of a laser beam at the end of an, an endoscope, um, and particularly thought of as being planned for uh, minimally invasive laser surgery. Um, there's a th uh, there are three small articulating mirrors it built into the system that move within a tiny cylinder to steer a laser path along what's considered a high range of motion to very small target sizes and very complex anatomy. So think lungs, uh, think DVTs, um, think in terms of you're know, really getting down to some very small spaces. The device resides in the working channel of an endoscope, and in addition to being able to be very uh, articulate in terms of uh, move, moving it, the device has a very uh, small footprint, about the size of a drinking straw, 
and can offer very fast and precise action in terms of delivering uh, a laser energy to, um, for example, shrink a cancer. Um, they anticipate the design of this will really improve surgical capabilities, particularly because they're designing it to be a plug and play add to uh, conventional endoscopes. Very interesting. All right, the next diagnostic um, is a human blood diagnostic. This almost ended up in that last category of how uh, we really, really need this. So this is a device that's able to distinguish between human blood and animal bloods. Why we might need this? Well, for criminal investigations and particularly for um, those uh, times when you've driven at night and you've crashed into something whilst you've been driving in the dark you think it's a deer, you hope it's a deer, and hopefully it's not another human being. And so what this device is able to do is take a sample without destroying the sample um, and using something called Fourier Transform Infrared spect Spectroscopy, a laser light is shone on the sample and the material molecules absorb the light in a unique way, indicating that the chemicals are present in the sample. So they've done some clinical tests with this system and they've shown 100% accuracy to be able to differentiate between human and non-human samples. Um, this uh, academic team from Albany is working with the New York State Police Crime Lab to incorporate uh, the device into a portable handheld um, that will be worn or um, in, the, in a, uh, a cop car. All right, the next diagnostic is called Lung Pass, and this is a, essentially a digital stethoscope that can analyze sounds from the lungs to help diagnose and objectively monitor for respiratory conditions, uh, such as they're focusing uh, of their on their first uh, release um, on pneumonia and co, uh, co COPD. So it's designed to be low cost, relatively speaking, at 105 bucks, um, and could be used for monitoring conditions at home, as seen on the visual here. It's very, it's designed to be very user friendly, but it can also be used by clinicians um, uh, in their clinics. Um, and uh, there's a timely diagnosis, um, as well as an, an initiation of therapy um, which is important uh, to be able to particularly to address for pneumonia. So because you now have um, a more accurate understanding of what's going on in the lung, um, you can get treatment for that patient uh, much, more, much more quickly. So the core technology behind this is uh, leveraging a database of lung sounds that Healthy Networks from Estonia has developed um, as, that are associated with different, uh, uh, dif different respiratory issues. The app instructs, uh, walks the user on how to use the device and describes the sounds that are being detected and what their potential meaning would be. Um, they're seeking a European CE mark approval first and then uh, will plan to roll out to the US. ELISA. ELISA stands for Enzyme Linked Immunosorbent Assays. And there are a number of these different tests uh, out there uh, today. Um, this one is offering a real-time ability to track concentrations of any protein, any antibody or hormone in bud, blood by providing a continual stream snapshot readings that uh, can give you an understanding of trends in, in real time. It's a prototype microfluidic device. Um, it was initially designed for insulin and glucose levels, but uh, they can see it being uh, also used for a, a whole bunch of other different proteins. Um, and essentially the design is uh, creating a protein sandwich of two antibodies that are stuck together. One seeks out and attaches to the protein that's been studied while the other acts as a fluorescent marker um, that activates that it shines or uh, illuminates uh, when um, the connection of the first uh, antibody is, is made to the protein it's trying to track out. And that brightness of that fluorescence can be uh, detected and objectively measured um, uh, to provide uh, an indication of uh, positivity. All right, moving into therapy devices, the Cool Seal Vessel Sealing by Boulder Surgical is designed to dissect, seal, and divide vessels in just a few section, six seconds using what's called bipolar radio frequency technology. Um, it's a low power and it has a minimal thermal spread. Uh, so damage to other surrounding tissue is really minimized compared to some of the other uh, vessel sealing products that are out there. Um, the, the, the handling of it involves a dual action. Uh, there are outer jaws that enable a precision dissection and then quick sealing. 
And because it's a, a cooling uh, uh, application, there's actually no risk of accidental injury. And they've launched this product uh, for, into the marketplace. I'm working on a project right now that involves um, deep vein thrombosis. So this particular uh, program is uh, particularly, this particular innovation is very interesting to me. This is an ultrasonic DVT drill. Um, if you've been in the DVT category in the past, you know that clots can be very calcified and very stubborn and can adhere to walls and uh, just be you know, very difficult to remove from the body. And the longer they are and the, and the longer they've been in the body, uh, the harder and tougher they are to wrestle with, uh, to remove. And if you don't deal with it um, as a DVT, then it can move up to the um, other more uh, critical parts of the body, like the heart and the lungs, and uh, very quickly kill people. So this ultrasonic drill can break clots apart using nano droplets. Um, there's liquid spheres that are filled with perfluorocarbons or PFCs that are able to pe penetrate deep into the, even the densest, most, most kind of glunky uh, blood clots and then applies an ultrasound wave. And when it hits those spheres, those, that liquid then converts into gas and expands that then breaks apart that clot. Um, they've done some initial animal studies, NC State University have done these animal studies and they've found that this tech can reduce the size of a clot by 40%. Um, so that can be really meaningful to be able to help remove it. Um, they do plan to um, do further safety and efficacy testing um, as part of you know, the startup work that they're doing. All right, this is definitely uh, gets the, the, the heart bleeding and the, and the eyes weeping, carpe diem, which is a beautiful name. Um, it actually has a meaning uh, beyond its uh, Latin version, which is cardio renal pediatric dialysis emergency medicine device. This has taken about 10 years for Medtronic to develop apparently. And it's the first device intended to provide dialysis for pediatrics and neonates. Um, it's pretty, uh, pretty significant. Uh, uh, disease that's a uh, pretty significant patient population has been really under supported by dialysis machines today. So it's specifically indicated for patients at 5.5 to 22 pounds, so the small guys um, who have acute kidney injury or fluid overload sometimes as a result of a, um, a, a cardiac surgery. Um, and so in the past, clinicians have tried to adapt uh, the, the current uh, adult sized uh, renal replacement uh, therapy machines. Uh, working off label, but those are a lot less precise because they're assuming a, a larger body and a larger a mass of blood that um, is involved. And so um, there's a lot more risk in, uh, innate in, in going off label with some of those larger adult sized dialysis machines. So the aid for Medtronic for designing something for kids. They've gotten FDA approval and they're piloting at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. All right, the next uh, therapy device is the Vegas Nerve Stimulator from Texas A&M. This is, a, um, this is a, an alternative to gastric bypass, which uh, if you know anything about uh, that particular type of surgery, it's very invasive. It involves creating a small stomach pouch and rerouting digestive tract. It takes a long time to do the surgery and it takes a long time for patients to recover. So this new widget is just a centimeter size it uses optogenetics uh, to simulate the endings of the vagus nerve with light um, to provide uh, the patient with a feeling of fullness um, and is an alternative to gastric bypass. Um, there's a minimal surgical procedure used to place uh, the implant in the stomach and then it can be controlled externally using a remote um, radio frequency source. Pretty dramatic difference in terms of the therapy option. All right, this is also a disability device as well as a therapeutic. Um, the olfactory stimulation device uh, coming out of New Zealand. Um, the olfactory nerves, um, so the, 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 smell, the smelling capability nerves, if you will, um, have uh, terminals deep in the brain region. Um, and they are associated, those, that same, those same terminals are the what, um, in the brain are the areas that influence our memory and our ability to navigate. So when you start to lose smell, except for COVID, if you start to lose smell, um, it can be seen as an early sign of Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. And so the, well, this particular academic team have really uh, started to study uh, the correlation between those two things. So what this device is doing is stimulating the olfactory function in the brain. Um, and uh, they have found that by doing this, they can see signs of consciousness in unresponsive patients with severe brain injury. 
Um, this device was developed to um, provide electrical stimulation to the brain's olfactory region using six different electrodes and then study its efficacy for preventing or at least slowing dementia uh, related to neurodegeneration. So um, there could actually be a cure, a more specific cure or a, a preventive a treatment for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's coming. Another disability um, device is uh, for those with spinal cord injuries. Um, when you have one of these, it can be pretty life uh, debilitating, literally, um, but also really crushing in terms of uh, what uh, your future holds. So this is a transcutaneous simulation, stimulation device coming out of the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, and what they found is that by um, uh, stimulating this part of the, uh, the neck and particularly the nerves underneath the neck uh, can have some significant improvement for hand and arm function of spinal cord injury patients. So these two band-aid like patches are placed on the back of the neck and deliver electrical pulses to those nerves right below that skin surface. And in a human subject study um, trial that they did, um, they asked patients to perform physical tasks both with and without the electrical uh, stimulation. And after a few months of training with one system, one patient who had spinal cord injuries was able to start to play music again for the first time in years. I can't imagine how emotional that, must, that moment must have been. Um, and what's wonderful about uh, this device is that the physical capability can stay after the rehab, it, it kind of stays adherent to the patient um, even six months after the rehab period. So, so you know, uh, the understanding uh, what we can do to improve and regain spinal cord uh, growth as a result of uh, stimulating the nerves is pretty incredible. All right, drug delivery. So this is a pretty simple device. I wouldn't call it a technology, but uh, in the context of medication adherence and all the challenges that we as a society have with trying to encourage people to stay uh, on their medications, this is a very uh, nice, uh, kind of quite nice design called Febrisol uh, from an inventor in South Africa. It's basically a sticker that you apply to your pill bottle and it has scratch off circles associated with each day of the week. Um, and you just, when you take your pill, you scratch it off and you can then intuitively have recorded documented whether you've taken the dose or not. Um, when you've taken the dose, a green check mark appears, which is also very intuitive. Um, it was a, designed um, for patients with HIV and AIDS, a particular issue in, Af in uh, the African countries. Um, and one of the reasons why they focus on these um, these two disease states is that a missed dose can actually have a really significant impact uh, to the virus, allowing it to mutate uh, even if you've missed by one day um, and cause more drug resistant strains in the body. This next drug delivery uh, uses micro bubbles um, to um, deliver drug via ultrasound uh, coming from University of Leeds. Um, and the intent is to more precisely deliver a drug uh, to areas of the body so that you can be more effective without creating more toxins uh, through all of the general body. So particularly useful for cancer, uh, which when, uh, when you have to take drug treatments for cancer, it can really knock out a patient because there are negative and very toxic, toxic effects for the whole body. For example, one's hair falling out. So um, this device, this uh, technology is designed to be able to um, really deliver a very focused drug load to precisely at where the tumor is at. Um, when the, uh, the microbials are attached to antibodies that uh, are, are programmed to seek out the growth hormone associated with the blood tumor vasculature, when they're at the, uh, at the target, the ultrasound is used to then break up those micro bubbles that then release uh, their therapeutic payload uh, into um, that local area. And what they found is that this enables the ability to deliver a higher concentration to the tumor at a lower dose holistically for the body. So it uh, could have really dramatic effects to how we uh, treat for cancer moving forward. Right, a couple of uh, uh, technologies in the other space, uh, J-Bud frames, uh, you know, we're also used to putting pods into our ears to uh, listen uh, to music and uh, other um, video conference calls like this one. Um, J-Lab Audio has developed a personal audio thrower that attaches instead of to your earbuds to the frames of your eyeglasses or sunglasses. Um, and the, the, the 
there's a driver built into the system that directs the sound to the wearer's ears in a way that other folks can't hear um, and therefore can't complain about how loud the music is emitting from your earphone, your headphones. But it also enables the wearer to be much more aware of the world going on around them while still listening to their music. Um, that would be a good thing for my team who likes to put in their, their uh, iPods and say, what, what, can't hear you. Um, so each of these uh, JBUD frames uh, weighs uh, 0.4 ounces and can be used either independently of each other or be used together to create that stereo sound effect. And there are buttons on the housing to control playback, uh, phone calls and uh, volume. And they've actually tried to design it so it's a really uh, price, uh, cost effective solution uh, compared to some of the more expensive um, earbud and headphone systems that are out there. They launched at CES this past January. Another uh, category in the other category is the Smart Electrical Outlet Socket or CEOS, also from National University of Singapore. Um, what this is doing is trying to minimize the amount of vampire um, electronic use um, where you have a device that's off but plugged into a wall but still drawing power. So this tech uses a network of small wall outlet faceplates uh, that have near field or NFC communication tags placed on each plug of each appliance's power cord. So there's definitely an investment in capital um, that's associated with the plug, with the outlet, as well as a network for each building. All the outlets that are enabled with the system are um, in one building are connected to a Wi-Fi uh, via a central server so that when you plug a device into the outlet, the NFC is able to identify the specific appliance, let's say a toaster, um, because of the unique, unique code um, on, uh, that's associated with that appliance. The server then determines the electrical specification that that appliance needs from a database that's been established by the homeowner. And it can turn that appliance off or on to the appropriate power level and then shut it off at the outlet. You can either choose to uh, do that automatically or through the app that's provided uh, through the, the Wi-Fi internet connection. So when the appliance is not in use, it won't draw any, any current. Um, they estimate that this uh, system could help reduce um, particularly larger building use by up to 60%. Um, the cost that they're looking at is about $80 per outlet. So it's a significant investment. Um, and it's, uh, it would be difficult, I think, to do a retrofit um, in uh, many houses. So they're probably try gonna try and focus on a new building construction for this system. Another environmentally saving technology called Water Saver by L'Oreal. Um, did you know that daily washing of hair uses up a hell of a lot of water? Um, and this system is intended, they, they, they're launching it in hair salons first. Um, it's designed to reduce the amount of water by up to 80% for a hair washing experience. It uses something called jet fusion technology that involves angling two water systems directly down towards each other so that they collide at the point of your hair where you're washing it. Uh, and this causes the water to form smaller droplets, apparently one tenth of the size of the original water droplet size. And that water droplet is actually able to rinse shampoo and conditioner out of the hair faster, therefore using less water. Um, they've been piloted, piloted this in um, some New York City hair saloons um, and they're planning a at home device uh, for next year. Um, so there's a global launch um, for Beyond New York City um, later in this year. And of course, there's an app that shows you how much water you save. All right, uh, in terms of COVID, um, the, uh, this next uh, system is using kinetic touchless buttons. So thinking about looking at that GIF on the right hand side there, um, thinking about having to touch an elevator in a hospital, thinking about how many other people have touched it with their germy hands, um, this might be of uh, interest. Um, David Copeland, one of our um, industrial designers uh, in Minneapolis, uh, tagged this one for us. Um, and how it works is um, it's uh, using gesture-based uh, gesture interface um, that enables uh, the button to understand whether you're trying to push or pull or even create a sliding action um, and respond in kind. This next COVID related device is called the RESP system by Strados. Um, they um, have uh, used this in, in clinical trials to monitor how um, uh, 
the combination of therapies and patient self-reporting and vital signs correlate with changes in lung sound. Um, and so this device can be used by clinicians to monitor for COVID patients um, and the effect the disease is having on their lungs, particularly for the long COVID uh, symptom uh, folks. Um, as you can see from the image, the um, device attaches to the chest and listens to asculation sounds as well as coughs and wheezes. Um, the information or the data is collected in a HIPAA uh, compliant cloud server for clinician review and is able to show trend analysis over time. They've got an FDA approval. For the clinicians out there um, who are having to wear a hell of a lot of PPE and uh, getting uh, under quite a lot of heat stress as a result, because most PPE is not really designed to be um, uh, porous in terms of uh, breathability. Um, this clinic, clinician cooling vest uh, coming out of an academic uh, medical center in Holland was actually originally developed for athletes to help them cool down uh, pretty quickly after their training or uh, performance um, competitions. So they've been trialing this for nursing staff who have long you know, 12 plus hour shifts in COVID wards um, and, and to be worn under full PPE. Um, they found that uh, without this device, um, a, where a, uh, a clinician can have a, a, a body temperature of 97 degrees Fahrenheit after three hours of wear. That's pretty, that's a lot of stress of heat on the body. Um, so these vests are stored in, a, stored in a refrigerator prior to use and have, as you can see, you know, it's pretty simple design, have 36 pockets of phase change material that are built into a polyurethane shell. And um, they have found that in the, in the clinical trials, that in addition to obviously lowering body temperature, which is, which is what it's designed to do, it actually has helped staff lower their heart rate. So they are a lot more, well, they're somewhat more relaxed and therefore can make more calmer decisions um, and feel at the end of the 12 hour shift that it's not been as physically ex exerting. And what I don't know is how much this weighs and so what that weight burden puts on, uh, on the individual. Um, but the fact that they're trying to explore ways to improve a clinician quality of life during their work is important. The Aura Ring um, is something that we featured in the past and it is a um, body tracking device uh, monitoring for various different elements of uh, biomarkers such as fever, um, respiratory rate and physical activity just from, a, ring, uh, just from a, a finger in your hand. And what they, uh, what Aura has done is teamed up with University of California, San Francisco, as well as San Diego to explore um, whether the Oura ring can be um, something that can be used as an early sign for COVID um, because there are symptoms that can be measured uh, with uh, their biomarkers. So um, because the sensors are able to monitor these various different things, uh, their hypothesis moving into this clinical trial was that fever-like events that actually go unre unreported because it's actually quite a low-grade fever, might, fever might actually um, be a, a symptom that can be communicated to a patient that they don't even know they have COVID. And so uh, potentially this enables Aura to, uh, to be marketing to hospitals to apply to patients or for patients who are looking to uh, to understand this better for themselves. Okay, a series of new masks that have come to market. Uh, uh, UC um, San Diego have developed a COVID testing sensor that can be applied to anything really, but uh, they've designed it, uh, they, they featured it as being designed to be attached to a mask. So when you have COVID, um, your breath is actually a, uh, exhaling a protease, which is an enzyme that speeds up the breakdown of proteins, and those proteases can be detectable, um, and be particularly detectable by this sensor. It has a pregnancy-like strip that has a small blister shown in this kind of red bubble here, um, uh, so that when that blister is popped, it then can start the test um, and determine whether um, the strip, the test strip has been exposed to these protease particles based on who's breathed on you. Um, and if uh, the protease, uh, COVID protease um, uh, is present, um, the color changes to indicate a positive result of the test strip. And so they thought to attach this to face masks um, to be uh, acting as a surveillance monitor, both for the individual wearing the mask, as well as the individual that's been exposed to other people. Um, the cost of goods that they are, have anticipated for this is uh, just uh, two cents. So 
um, uh, pretty viable in terms of its uh, uh, ramp up in production. Log3 mask by University of Minnesota. Mike Metz, uh, one of our engineers in Minnesota, also sent this one through. Um, Claris uh, is a spin off of University of Minnesota, and they have uh, developed this mask to that they claim killed COVID virus on the spot. The virus is made from a textile that has both antiviral and antimicrobial properties. Um, just like all the other masks that we're wearing, has different layers um, uh, built into it to kind of prevent both wearers' droplets from you know, reaching other people as well as other people's reaching them, of course. But these three, um, these, this fabric is actually, the, the novelty of it is that it is uh, developed using something called Crea, Crea, Crest Coating, which is infusing a zinc solution into the fabric and then heating up that fabric solution uh, to form zinc nanoparticles that adhere to the fabric uh, pretty uh, well, even after 100 washes, the zinc particles are still present. And when the zinc is exposed to humidity or water from a breath, from breath and breathing into this mask, it, that's, it, the zinc particles release positive ions that are attracted to and can break through uh, a coronavirus uh, capsid envelope and then bind to the virus RNA proteins and then essentially making the virus inactive all within um, wearing the mask for 10 minutes. Um, it's a little bit more expensive than some of the masks out there, but um, they are commercially available today and they're seeking FDA approval for um, higher indication claims. All right, this is our last technology. Celeste Greenberg, one of our uh, design researchers and industrial designers sent this one to me. And you know, pets are getting tested too. And if you live in South Korea, you've probably gotten tested, you've probably gotten both vaccines already and gosh darn it, South Korea has its beat. So it's so much so that they have gotten, they've instituted a program where if you suspect your pet has COVID, you can get them tested too. In January, one kitten in South Korea tested positive, and so therefore the city of Seoul decided they had to embark on a COVID testing plan for all pet cats and dogs. I just think it's wonderful, and I just love that picture of that dog's <laughs> dog nose with a nasal probe being put up in it. The dogs don't like it either. So <laughs> this is this policy is now implementation for those people living in uh, the city of Seoul. Your pet also has a quarantine if they get a positive test, <laughs> just to know. All right, that's it for this uh, this month. Um, we keep all of our archive um, to mine and discuss for uh, future uh, other projects. Um, our next innovation forum we plan for the second Thursday in uh, of every month, so that will be eleventh of March um, in twenty twenty one, not twenty twenty. Thank you, Jess. That was awesome, as always. I think you're getting faster um, because some of, some of our previous months we we took a little too long to get started. So I think that's made you faster, but super interesting. Um, there's been a fun chat going here as well. So um, thank you. Thank you, Zymedica. Thank you, Nemec. Um, we really, really enjoy partnering with you to bring this awesome monthly program to a larger audience. Um, so we hope you'll all join us again next month for March's uh, MedTech Forum.